you, though, yeah. in order to stay connected. Absolutely. Hey, do us a favor today and begin to share this link with somebody. Yeah. You don't know how many amazing stories that That's we right. have heard week in and week out of somebody being invited That's to right. a service to hang out with us and how that's just been life transforming for them. So do us a favor, share this link with somebody, invite them with you to church yeah. today. And that means the most to us. And at the same time, like and subscribe. Yeah. How many likes and subscribers do we have now? Do you know the number? I believe it's, it's over 7,000 on YouTube, amazing. which is yeah. unreal. People from all over the country watching from country, every different the world, state, right? Over 10 countries, okay. all 50 states have it's tuned amazing. in. Yeah. It's just incredible what oh, God is so doing. Cool. It's so, yeah, so yeah. cool to celebrate. Hey, by the way, can we say hello to some people? I, I was about have, to say, we got a couple people. Yeah, we have Kat from Connecticut. Hello. Good Kat. to see you. What's going she was on? She's actually here. Yeah. Had to move out of state, but I believe is as creating watch parties now yeah. at her yeah. at her place. So, Kat, we miss you. We love you. In Connecticut, all the way from yeah. South Florida, we yeah. are sending up the heat and humidity maybe your way. <laughs> or you can Hopefully send down not. the pool. Hopefully yeah, not. yeah, yeah, right? Send us some cool. Who else we got, man? <laughs> yeah. Um, just people from all over. We heard from, yeah. actually a story of someone on our production team from Ohio. Yeah, Adam, who, I believe. Yeah. yeah who uh, found out and actually... Uh, said, okay, I'm going to figure out how I can work remotely to be in South Florida from right. week to week. Uh, and so I think every other week he's here, and then he's back in Ohio. Back in Ohio. And he's now serving on a production team. So, isn't that cool? So cool. That's yeah. awesome, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. So Adam, Kat, wherever you guys yeah. are, man, we love Just you. Just to say hello you. to you guys. And, and we would love to know where you're tuning in from, too, all over the country, all over the world. Uh, drop it in the chat. We would love to know that. Yep. And as well, if, if Church at Home has impacted you uh, in any way, we would love to hear your story. Please. You can share your story with yep. us. Uh, let us know in the chat. Praise God for what he's doing in your life. Uh, and if he's transformed you in any way, we want to know about it. It would yeah. be really cool. Yeah, the link for that is actually gojourneychurch.com forward slash share your story. story yeah. So let us know. Uh, we have a lot to, of... I tried to say that in unison with you. <laughs> Thank share, you. Share, like, share your share story. Okay, I'm going to time that up perfectly. I think I botched it. <laughs> hey, ladies, if you're listening, ladies, we have something really important for you to know as well. At the end of September, September 29th and 30th, yep. it's going to be our Thrive Conference. Lika, er, Lika, Lisa Turkers. <laughs> I could never say her name right, though. I feel so bad. Lika Turquist or Turquoise. It is. No, I'm botching this. <laughs> so Lisa bad. Turkis. Lika, Lisa Turkis. Lika Turkis. How yep. do you say it? Lisa Turkis. That's how you say it? Yes, that's how you say it. <laughs> she is an amazing, <laughs> renowned speaker. Sorry, if Lisa ever sees this, Lisa, I apologize. I apologize. I have a weird last name, too. People botch it all the time. But we are so excited to have Lisa in the house. It's going to be a famous author, speaker, teacher. Uh, she's going to be here for our Thrive Conference. Ladies, yeah. you want to sign up for that. Uh, hopefully, the link will be in the chat for you as well. And we can't wait to see you in service. Let's get after yeah, it. Yeah, come on. Enjoy today. Thanks, Church Home.
over you this is psalm 37 it says trust in the lord and do good 
then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Trust him and he will help you. Come on church, I'm gonna say that one more time. Trust him and he will help you. We can trust him today because he's trustworthy. We can trust him today because he's good, because he's faithful. We can trust him today because scripture says when we cry out to him, he hears us. He hears your cry. Whatever your story is, whatever you're walking through at any season in your life, whether you're here or you're in a different state right now, he hears you when you cry. So together today, we're gonna sing a song about the trustworthiness of God. We're gonna celebrate the fact that when we cry out to him, he hears us. So let's sing this together, every voice. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary was more than enough. So we trust in him, every voice. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
Thank you, Lord. We're so thankful for you, Jesus, that you never fail us, that you never leave us. And even when we don't know what to say, our worship and our praise is more than enough for you, God. Thank you, Lord. place just acknowledging just acknowledging God's presence we don't want to miss moments like this where God is working and moving in his people 
and we raise hands, sometimes our words will fall short and we just need to raise our hands as a sign of surrender and acknowledgement to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Come on, the one who is worthy of all of our praise, every bit of it. And in this moment, before we take a seat, can you just begin to, in your own heart, in your own words, begin to thank God for what He has done for you, for your family, that He has never once let you down, that He has been faithful and true. And so our hearts overwhelm this morning with gratitude and they overflow with gratitude. Can you just take a moment? Just take a moment right now in the quietness of this moment and thank Him for what He's done for you. That he's not just our God, he's your God. He is your shepherd, he is your king, your savior. Would you pray with me, church? Father, we thank you in this moment. And our hearts are overwhelmed with gratitude. Father, we look at the cross today and we look at the empty tomb and we just say thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the nail-scarred hands, Lord, that you would gladly give your life. You would lay it down so we could have life in you. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit and his presence in this place, that the transformative power of God is in the room ready to meet with us. Let us never take that for granted. Let us never be, let it never be lost on us today, Lord, that you want to meet with your people and you inhabit the praise of your people. So we just give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, and all the journey church said, amen and amen. Come on, give them praise in this place today. So good to see you. You can have your seat and on your way down to your seat, would you scoot in just a little bit because we are filling up in the room and it's a good, good problem to have. I want to welcome all of those joining us as well at Church at Home. I mean, wherever you are around the country, around the world, uh, we're so thankful that you're with us. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, Church at Home or in the room, I know I was on pregame with Church at Home, so hopefully we would know one another. But in the room, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I absolutely love this house. If you call this place home, do you love your church? Come on. So good. Hey, if you're new or newer though, and you're like, how do I get connected? My questions answered, maybe a prayer request in or find out more information. I want you to do something really quickly for me. Take out your phone and on the seat back in front of you, there's going to be a connection hub there. It's that black plate that says connect here or tap here. Your phone is actually going to be able to pick that up. It's an NFC chip. It's really cool technology, we love it. Hold your phone, the back of your phone to that plate, and you're gonna have some options pop up. There's gonna be a link that you can click onto. That all of what I just mentioned can be solved there. You can get connected, a prayer request, and we would love for you to just to, or have record of your visit and for you to feel connected to this place too. So the Connect Hubs are there, a front row, you're gonna have a connection card, and Church at Home, you have your own digital connect card there and we're just excited man God is doing so much in this house and through this house and one of those incredible things was back to school bash where are my students or parents of students in the room we got them all spread out throughout the room which is amazing our back to school bash was off the charts it happened this past Wednesday parents if you missed it students if you missed it uh, man don't miss next year because it was incredible over 550 students showed up to our campus which is bananas the next generation church is on fire and it is hungry for Jesus. And you know how I know that? 110 of those students came forward to give their lives to Jesus at the end of that night. A fifth of the room, think about that, church at home in the room, a fifth of this room got up and came forward to give their life to Jesus. There were so many kids at the altar, it was hard to even count how many of those came forward. And as you can see behind me, we had an absolute blast. It was such a party and what a great way to start off the year. So thank you again for everybody involved, all of our student volunteers, our youth volunteers. You guys are amazing. Uh, and Journey Youth, we just love you. We believe in you. And uh, our church is growing. Not only is student ministry growing, but this place is growing. Our 9 and 11, I want you to listen up. Our 9 o'clock service, you guys in the room today. Uh, and then I'll speak to our 11 uh, in the next service. But man, I have a, a, just a, a challenge for you that you would commit to the vision of this next year moving forward and into 2024 that we believe God is growing this house our services are filling up 
And as we hit 80% capacity in the room, statistically, people will just stop coming to church because they won't find a seat. If a family of four or five show up and they want to sit together, the room is pretty packed out. And we want to make as much room as possible for people to experience the transformation uh, that Jesus has for them. We love solving problems like this too. This is a great problem that we're part of a growing, thriving church that is making such a difference in our community. But what we're going to ask specifically of our 9 and 11 service over these next few weeks is that you would begin to pray through what God might be calling you guys to as a family. And here's the two options that we would have for you. And this is a big step. This would be a big leap of faith for you and your family. I know it would be inconvenient. You're going to change services, all of that. But man, as I talked about last week, there are some things worth doing because we want to see so many people transformed. And that ask would be this. The first one would be you can sh switch to our 1245 service. You can jump services. We have plenty of room in our 1245. We want to grow that service as well. Reach our community. If you want to sleep in on a Sunday, man, that sounds nice to me. I don't know about you. All the nine o'clock's like, no, we love our early service. I know we're creatures of habit. All right. I'm just going to call it out. We would love if you would take that step of faith and jump into the 1245 or if you find yourself on the east side uh, and you're closer to a Boynton or Del Rey or a Boca and you're driving all the way here, we'd love if you would actually stop and park at our Boynton campus and call that place home with Pastor George. You're going to hear more about that over the next few weeks. But we're going to ask 100 families to commit to that. 100 families that would say, yeah, I'll jump into the either 1245 or I'll, I'll be part of growing our East Campus because we believe God has given us a great mandate to reach our community, South Florida, locally and globally. We cannot wait to see what God's going to do. But over these next few weeks, we're going to ask you to commit to the vision. There's going to be a cool gift too for, for those that do make the jump, by the way. We've got some exclusive Journey swag coming for, for just you. You'll only have that. It's very exclusive, which is cool. Uh, but just a huge thank you from your pastors as well. We want to say uh, thank you for even beginning to pray about that, what God might be calling your family to, because we want to make as much room in our 9-11 services as possible. And then our Boynton campus is also ready to receive people. And we want to see God move in power over this next year uh, and, and see this place grow as much as possible. So we're so excited. And we know that we grow too, not just in the context of here on Sunday mornings, but in groups and in community, our groups rally. Where are all my groups, people? You're like, I love small groups. I eat, sleep, drink, breathe them. Our groups rally is coming up next week, August 27th. Mark your calendars. You're going to be able to jump into community that will change and transform you. Celebrate the wins. Grieve the losses. You need people in your corner, church. That's all I'm going to tell you. I would not be here this day without small groups in my life that have transformed and changed me and championed me in my faith. So I want you to be part of that. Next week will be your opportunity to jump in sign up for a group. You can actually, through the group's rally, kind of shop through the groups too. Find the right fit for you, uh, maybe your spouse or your family. Uh, as a whole family, you can jump into those things as well. And then lastly, I'll challenge you. This is your last week. If you want to lead a group, you're like, God, uh, God's calling me into that next step. And I would love to see people change. I'd love to help lead that and facilitate that. Today, we actually have a leader training in between the 9-11 service right over at our venue. We'd love if you would take advantage of that. Jump in find out how you can serve people and lead people through a group this semester. You can find all that information out in the lobby, and then that training will be in the venue as you leave. And last but not least, certainly not least, how many excited Pastor Scott's back in the house from his sabbatical? Pastor Scott had a great time on his sabbatical uh, of a couple months away here, and he is back in the house fired up with a brand new series called Colliding Worlds. You're going to want to lean in, take great notes, and do this for me because he was away for a while. When he comes out here, just give him the craziest journey welcome you can back to the stage. Church, we love you. Thanks again for being here at Journey. Check this out. My name is Vicki Carlton, and I have been attending Journey for 14 years. Mi nombre es Eduardo. Yo soy de Chile. Mi esposa es Claudia de Colombia, y vamos a a la iglesia de Journey en Lake Worth desde el año 2014. Rooted for me when I started into Rooted was it took me back to the first time I met Jesus. It was like the whole whole new birthing. It just all, all over again. I just really got connected and it took me back to so many first time things. It was absolutely amazing. Yo creo que los pequeños grupos, especialmente para nosotros, la gente que habla español, Más que un grupo desarrolla un concepto de comunidad y de familia. Rural para mí es un estudio que debe, debe todos, todos en la iglesia deben 
deben tomar este estudio, porque el crecimiento y el enraizamiento que tenemos nosotros en Dios es para nuestro propio crecimiento personal y de toda la comunidad. I happen to have led a group of all women and we truly developed a sisterhood. I mean, each of us went through something strong while we were doing Rooted and it seemed like that week seemed to uh, really resonate with each, at least one of us somehow in a strong way and how we just bonded through that. It was amazing. And we just helped each other through some really rough time as a, a true sisterhood. Eh, Rooted no solamente es un curriculum, es, un, es una cadena de amistad donde aprendemos a ser vulnerables, aprendemos a ser transparentes y aprendemos a ser a ser familia y ayudar mutuamente cada vez que lo necesitamos. Rooted is, it's just falling in love with Jesus all over again is really what it's like. So for that first time person, it's getting to really know him and falling in love with him. For the person that's been saved for a while that kind of looks at the curriculum like, oh, I don't think that's for me. Oh, it is for you. It's so for you. Because it's taking you back to just remembering what brought you to where you are the first time you fell in love with him. Ven con muchas expectativas, pero también ven a recibir. Porque lo que vas a recibir va a ser más grande de las expectativas que tú puedas tener. Hey, everybody. Well, it is, uh, it is good to be back. Thank you very much. It is... Uh, It is special um, to be back here in the house, and we missed you guys, my family and I all here in, in the front row. And of course, I want to welcome our Boynton campus. I actually had the opportunity over, over my break to go there a few times because I, I wasn't here. It was so great uh, just connecting with you and all of the church at home people. I lived in your world for a few months as I was uh, traveling. A um, couple years ago, my wife and I made that decision that, hey, the church is turning 20 this year, by the way, which is crazy. We planned it 20 years ago. Um, and, and my kids, my kids aren't getting younger. My wife's not getting younger. No, I'm kidding. We're not getting younger. And so we we're like, hey, what, if, what would it look like if on our 20th year, we kind of just took a few months with a family and traveled the world. And so we went uh, to Brazil and North Carolina and Colorado and Orlando. I think we were in town like 10, 12 days out of 60 days um, and just had an amazing opportunity to kind of rest, to, to be with the family and just create uh, really, really special memories. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, by the way, for, to you guys is one of the most incredible things about it was When I actually came back and I got cut off with the lead team and everything like that, just, I have to say something. Your pastors that ran this church while I was gone for a few months did an amazing job, weren't they? Like, uh, Pastor Josh, Pastor Jonathan on the executive team, I kind of put them as over everything while I'm gone. And, and the lead team, George and, and, and John, they just, these guys, these guys are so many. I mean, I'm coming back and I'm hearing all the stories of everything that God was doing and these incredible men that were leading an incredible church. And it was like, wow, like my wife and I just felt so blessed um, to have such an incredible team around us. Amen. And now we're ready to get back and we got a lot of things to build in the kingdom of God. Amen. We got a lot of exciting things happening th this year and uh, so excited about. But, but today what I want to do is I actually want to share with you a lesson that God began to reveal to me over my break. And as I took this break, I wasn't intentionally wanting to learn a lot. <laughs> I was actually just wanting to have fun. But on this break, God began to reveal to me something that was so powerful. It's literally shifted how I see circumstances and, and issues and conflicts. It shifted how I live my life and priorities in different ways. And I believe it's been such a powerful tool to help me thrive. And I really believe this. I believe the lessons that God showed me over the next couple weeks as I share the With you, I really believe they can have an incredible impact on your life, on your future, on your relationships, on your children, on your family. And so I'm just excited about it. So in order to do that, I want to kind of set the stage by telling you a story. Well, many of you guys might not know this, but the first year of my wife's marriage and my wife and I's marriage, um, she was rollerblading when rollerblading used to be cool. And she's rollerblading. And I get this phone call is because this gentleman had ran a stop sign 
while she was going across it and hit her with the car. And not just like hit her and knocked her to the ground, like hit her on the top of the hood, hospital, back surgeries, four back surgeries, by the way, just really, really messed up thing. And so she had this back surgery, she went through it. But the problem was, as time went on, the pain began to get worse. And so we began to explore everything. I mean, she, poor girl, she couldn't lift anything. She was in bed for almost six months. She had this surgery. Afterwards, she did everything the doctors told her to do. Tried Pilates, she tried Pilates. Tried working out, started working out. Went to a massage, tried the massage. She tried chiropractic. Like every single thing that people could look at to alleviate the pain, nothing was successful. And so she would get more MRIs, she would get x-rays, she would go from doctor to doctor, and I would be there. They would look at the MRI. They'd look at the x-ray and go, we can't see it. Like we know you're in pain, but we can't see the root cause of the pain. Everything that we can see looks totally perfect. It's like the surgery was successful. And as we're looking at the imagery, there's no explanation for all of the pain that you're experiencing. Well, after years of this and years of this and all she went through, she finally um, reached out to a hospital in New York City called the Hospital of Special Medicine. And in this desperation, she's like, listen, I've tried everything. I want to fly out to New York. I want to meet with the best of the best. And she sits down with this doctor and the doctor looks at everything and goes the same thing. I can't see it. We can't find it. I'm looking. Everything looks fine. But here's what he said that was different. He said, but sometimes we can't see the root cause, even with all the technology and everything we have, we miss it. And the only way to really see the root cause so we can once again cure what's causing all of this pain is to actually open her up, peel back the layers and see what's actually there. And so she decided to go, you know what, at this point, I'll do anything. And she goes in to New York City and we fly in and she goes in and they do this surgery. And when they opened her up and her back, what they realized was this, that some of the screws that were put in her back were actually hitting a nerve that were causing all of the symptoms that she had. The issue wasn't her back. It was this thing that they could not see. This is so important because until they could understand the root cause, no matter no matter what they did, no matter what she did, nothing helped solve the problems in her life until she understood here's the root cause so they can deal with and discover the cure. And what no one could see, something invisible, was actually creating all of the physical things that she was dealing with in her life. Now, why do I say this? Here's why. Because I believe for many of us, this is exactly how the spiritual world is working is that for so many of us, we're going through life and we've got lots of symptoms, don't we? We've got ang anger and anxiety. We've got relationship conflicts. Our children are walking through seasons of, of rebellion. We have issues in our work and we have issues in our emotions and issues in our lives. And we're walking through this world and what we see are all of the symptoms. But what we don't always understand is what the scriptures reveal. And I want you to hear this. And what God begins to reveal to us is that the root cause to so many of the symptoms you are facing Facing in your life aren't actually physical. They're actually spiritual. That a world that you cannot see is actually impacting so much of the world that you can see. And a lot of us, listen to this, if you could actually peel back the layers in your life and you could see things, not what you perceive, like what's with your eyes, but see things how they really were, what you would actually discover is that the spiritual world is having a far greater impact on your mind, on your emotions, on your children, on your relationships, on your business, on your body, uh, on things in your life than you actually realize and understand. See, think about this for a moment. Think, especially for those of you that may, like, you know, you, you have a faith, you, you kind of believe in God. Just, just think of what, what God teaches about life. Think about this. Who created the physical world? The spiritual, right? So, so before there was physical, there was spiritual. And the spiritual God spoke into existence the physical realm. Why? Who has, once again, who has authority over the physical realm? Do you ever think about that? So, so not only did your, your, the spirit uh, exist before the physical and created the physical. And by the way, your physical life is temporary, but your spirit is eternal. So you realize the spirit's kind of a big deal, the spiritual realm. But listen to this. You also realize that when God created the physical realm, that spiritual has authority over the physical. This is why Jesus spoke to nature and what happened? Nature obeyed. 
Because even though you could not see the spiritual realm, he has authority over the physical realm. And God spoke a word to nature, and nature listened. This is why even the laws of science are subject to the spiritual world. And Jesus can walk on the water. He can ferment wine in a moment, not during the normal process. Like, none of the natural laws, all of them are subject to the spiritual. This is why Jesus could speak to sickness and heal, right? Because what do you see over and over again? That the spiritual realm created the physical realm and that the spiritual realm has authority over the physical realm and this is why this is this this is why all throughout the bible god makes you promise after promise that when you obey and honor spiritual principles he provides physical blessings you remember when he grabbed the nation of egypt uh, israel out of egypt and he tells them guys I'm going to give you my law my way. Here's what. You need to love God, put me first above all else, follow these ways. And if you will follow the spiritual way of life that I have given you and honor me, then I will make sure that I will bless your barns and your business and your family. I'll protect your land. I'll make you make all the nations jealous of you. I will bless every aspect of your life if you get the spiritual aspect of your life right. Why? Because what was God teaching us? And here's what I want you to see is that too often we look at this life in the world and we so focus on what we can see, the physical realm. And we have this idea that there is a spiritual, we believe in God, we believe in angels, we believe in heaven. And so we look at this world and we go, okay, there's the physical realm, it's my relationships, my dating, it's my business, it's my money, it's how I take care of myself. And then over here, there's like God and angels up in heaven. But when you actually look at the scriptures, what you see is not two separate worlds, but you actually see both the physical and the spiritual world in a constant state of colliding and interacting. And what you do in the spiritual actually impacts the physical. And what you do in the physical impacts the spiritual. In fact, the root cause of so many of the physical battles in your life, and you're gonna see this today, and I'm gonna show you over and over again how this works. What you're gonna see is that so much of the root issues in your life are actually spiritual. You think they're physical because that's all you can see. But if you could peel back the root cause, what you would discover is that your spiritual life has a far greater impact on everything that you do, not just Sunday morning, but in work, your career, your future, and in every aspect of your life. In fact, I love this story because I want to I start out with this in this series because today's kind of a foundation and next week we're going to get a little more practical. But today I just want you to, I want you to see the world, here's my goal, as it really is, not how you perceive it to be. Because I'm telling you right now, if God were to open your eyes to the way things really were, listen, there would be a whole lot more of us being paying attention to the spiritual realm because we would understand the impact. And so I say this because uh, many years ago, there was this king named Aram. And, and the king of Aram, excuse me, um, was going after God's people. And I love this story because God peels back like perception of reality and lets us see both the physical and the spiritual realm in the story. And so this, the king of Aram was going after the nation of of Israel. He was was trying to take them out. And every time he would create a plan to take out God's people, they would show up with their army. They were stronger, they were bigger, they were more powerful. And they would show up to take out God's people and God's people weren't there. I mean, they, they sent all these people, they were all ready. They had all of the strategy. And every time they would try to attack God's people, God would thwart spiritual, a thwart, would thwart the physical plan. And so this king gets furious and here's what he does. This enraged the king of Aram. So he summoned his offers and demanded of them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. Now notice the way he looked at his problems. The only avenue that he could see his problems was physical. Did you see that? Notice, he did not ever even give it a glimpse that part of the frustration that he was experiencing wasn't actually about something physical, tell us what what you've done wrong, what's wrong with our strategy, which one of you betrayed me, but what you will discover is what was actually causing the issues was, was spiritual that God was actually fighting against the king of Aram. And so listen to what the people say. They go, well, none of us. Like, why would we fight you? Like, why in the world we stick up for a group of people we're, gonna, we're more powerful than? Why would we risk our lives? He goes, it's none of us, my Lord, the king, said one of his offers, but it's Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel. And he tells the king of Israel, the very words you speak in your bedroom. In other words, hey, 
you think the problem is physical, but it's actually spiritual. And you think you can hide from the spiritual realm like gods are, you know, and angels are up in heaven somewhere. They're not. They're right intertwined with who you are. And so you can't hide from the spiritual realm because the spiritual realm has authority over the physical world. So what does the king do? Once again, he only looks at perspective through the physical. And so he goes, fine, here's the problem then. I will send an army and we're gonna take out this man, Elijah. And if I can take out Elisha, and if I can just take him out, then everything's gonna be fine. Because then I will beat this battle because once again, the king only looks. This is what I want us to learn. He only sees things through the perspective of what he sees in the physical realm. Now listen to this. So he sends an army to take out this guy. And the next morning, something needs to happen. And you look at what takes place. So when the servant of the man of God got up and he went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. He says, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. In other words, the servant starts to look at reality and he also only sees in the physical, right? So he's looking at his circumstances and all of his emotions and all of the choices and all of the strategy, only thing that he can perceive is he looks at him and Elisha, he looks at their, what they have and their power and their authority, and he looks at thousands of people with all of this army coming against them and he perceives reality only as the physical world. But notice how Elisha sees things. I want you to see this. For don't be afraid, the prophet answered. So he, less anxiety, right? Better strategy, more joy, more peace, all these things, because he sees things how they are. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I wasn't really good at math, especially the new math, but, but two people versus thousands of people. And I think that servant's looking at Elisha going, Elisha, did you drink communion wine last? Like, like it just, he, he's confused. He doesn't see, you know why? because he doesn't see. And so Elisha prays this prayer to God. And look at the prayer that Elisha prays. And I want you to see this. So, and Elisha prayed, God, will you open his eyes, Lord? Will you help him see not just the perception of reality, but reality, so that he may see? Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha that there was an angelic army that God had sent to protect him. The spiritual realm was there battling with the physical realm. And as soon as the enemy came down toward him, they would attack. Elijah simply asked God, prayed to God, Lord, hey, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, just as Elisha had asked. I love this, this picture because it kind of, an, an artist kind of rendered this, right? And so you see Elisha and a servant right here and you kind of get the glimpse of all the servant sees, the army and camp ready to kill them. But then you actually see the, uh, the, the big picture and the big picture is there's this army of angels so much greater, so much more powerful than anything that was against them. But here's what I want you to see that struck me. See, Elisha didn't pray. Hey God, look, we're in trouble. Would you send some angels to protect us? What did Elisha pray? God, will you just show him the way things really are right now? Would you, just, would you just take his perception of reality, which is not real, which means all he sees is the physical and it's very limited. It's not accurate. It's not truth. It's not the way it is. So would you simply take this illusion of reality he lives in, which is this physical realm is there, but then, and that's all he sees. And will you help him see the way things really are? are. And I love this picture because what it shows us is that you don't have the spiritual realm up in heaven and the physical realm like over here, that what you actually have is this constant case of these two worlds colliding over and over again. And if God had not opened his eyes, then here Elisha's servant would have been like, I don't know what happened. They were all there and then they got a virus and they got sick and they all ran. And that's just what happened. We don't understand. Like his explanation would have been physical because it would not have made sense. And what I love in this moment is that God peels back the curtain and says, hey, let me tell you, this is how the world actually is. In fact, just so you know, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, are not all angels ministering spirits sent by who? By God to serve, like to interact with you and me, right? Those who will inherit salvation. In other words, that God says, these spirits and angels aren't just up in heaven. I've actually sent them to you to serve, to protect, to do whatever God has, to get involved in your life. Now, here's the crazy thing. 
Most of us have never seen them, have we? And so many of us, so don't you see, and so many of us live our life just like Elisha's servant. And we're going through this world and all we see is a perception of reality, not reality. And so we look at this world and all our decisions, our future, our anxiety, our stress is all based upon everything that we can see in the natural, it's flesh, it's blood, it's logical. And so we live in this realm and we underestimate, listen to this, we underestimate how much impact the spiritual world is having on our spiritual life, on our physical life. Like the spiritual world changed their circumstances, didn't they? The spiritual world changed their outcome. The spiritual world gave them victory. The spiritual world gave them power they did not have. The spiritual world gave them a strategy. It wasn't run and hide. It was call down heaven to fight for them. In other words, everything changed in their life, their outcome, their circumstances, their emotion, when they were able to see how things really are. Could you imagine for a moment right now if God opened your eyes? <laughs> Like, I just, like, I know, first of all, I'd probably freak out. So it's probably, maybe don't pray that now. But like, like, because like every time someone sees an angel in the Bible, they fall to their faces, they're dead and they're terrified. So it's not like it's like a Hallmark angel, you know. It's like they're, they're warriors. They're, they're massive, incredible beings that God sends to serve us. But I, but I wonder what would happen just for one moment if you could actually see the way things really were in your world. I wonder if you could understand how many times that, that God has protected you and you didn't even see it. I wonder, I wonder how many times in your life that there's been spiritual battles in your life that didn't seem like spiritual and you thought they were, but you thought, thought they were physical, but there was, I, just, I just wonder for a moment how different we would live our lives if we could actually see the way the world works. Because I'm gonna just read you a couple of things, but I want you to see that over and over and over again, God reminds us, he screams out from his word about how the spiritual world is having a bigger impact in your life and how you live in your spiritual life and the weapons that, spiritual weapons and the spiritual armor and how you honor God and your prayers and obedience, like these things have a far greater impact on your success, on, on your relationships, on, your, on everything of your life. Because the spiritual realm, because existed before, the spiritual realm created the physical realm, has authority over the physical realm, and it's not two separate worlds. They are constantly colliding with each other. In fact, I love this story because it's just a reminder to us, and it's a story of a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And many of you have heard of Babylon the Great. It was the greatest empire in the world in his time. And Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man on earth. Like we don't even have anything that compares to him today. Like, like so Nebuchadnezzar was the richest. He commanded the strongest army. He had the strongest nation. He was revered by his people as if he was a god. They literally created statues of him to worship him. And he, his words, whatever he spoke, people did. He was feared. He was honored. He was respected. And he was the most powerful man in all of the world. And yet God began to deal with some of the things in his life. And so one day God kind of knocks on the heart of a prophet and he sends this prophet named Daniel to say, hey, tell the most powerful man in the world that if anybody didn't bow down and worship him, you just had him killed. I want you to tell this guy to stop sinning. And I want you to tell him that he better humble himself before me. He better stop oppressing people and he better start taking care of the poor or I'm gonna actually take everything from him. Now, Daniel, you go tell him that. Daniel's like, could my brother go? <laughs> like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So Daniel goes to this king and says, hey, king, great, mighty king, don't smite me or kill me. But listen, God wants to tell you something. You become prideful, you become arrogant, you've been oppressing people, you've been sinning, and God's telling me to tell you, so don't hit the messenger, if you don't repent, he's gonna take it all away and you're gonna become like a wild animal, homeless, he's gonna just destroy your whole life. Okay, just wanna let you know. All right, I'll see you later. And the king actually receives it because once again, I believe God was engaged to protect Daniel. See, nobody can do something against what God's will is if he doesn't want them to do it. And, and so Daniel goes to him and 12 months later, um, the king doesn't repent. And 12 months later, we're told that, that this, this king, this most powerful human being on earth is standing on his castle, looking out over the great Babylon. And he actually speaks out, look at the great Babylon that I have built by my hands for my glory and my honor. And look at what God does. Look what this power of the spiritual realm. Look at this. 
For even as the words were on his lips. So notice, as soon as he's literally speaking these words, look at Babylon the great that I have built by my hands, by my power, for my glory and my honor. As he's speaking those words, a voice came from heaven. God is speaking. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You no longer are going to be great. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox for seven times. You will pass by for you, and this is the thing, until you acknowledge, until you see things the way they really are, and here's the way they are, that, that the Most High is sovereign, has complete authority over all the kingdoms on earth, and He gives them to anyone He wishes and he can take them from anyone he wishes. And in that moment, he becomes like a wild animal. And he grows hair all over the place, and he kind of grazes like an ox. And for that period of seven seasons, he's there until finally he repents and he acknowledges. And then God, and I love this about God, he restores him. He gave him a chance to repent. He missed it. God punishes him. Okay, now I learned that lesson the hard way, God. And now he comes back, and you can read the rest of it. And he's like, God, I realize now you rule the spiritual kingdoms and the earthly kingdoms, and no one's like you, and you are great, and you're awesome, but it's not about me and he gets it but here's what I want you to see the spiritual world was so powerful that God said you think your might and your wisdom and your hard work built this kingdom I gave you the ability I made this decision and because you didn't acknowledge it I also can take it all away and in a word spoken by God and the authority of the spiritual realm changed the entire future and outcome of the most powerful moment man in a second See, see, what do you see? The spiritual world was not like out there. That, that because he wasn't honoring the spiritual principles that God had commanded him to live his life, God goes, hey, guess what? You didn't honor the spiritual principles, so here's what I'm going to do. Because the spiritual authority has, is over the physical, I'm gonna change everything in your life. I'm gonna take everything away I've given you to once and again help you acknowledge at the end of the day that the spiritual world is the root cause of the success and it can be the root cause of the failure when you mess it right, when you mess up. Because why? Because God's kingdom is greater, even though we can't see it. That invisible world that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't see impacted his physical realm. By the way, you see the same thing with King David. I want you to see this. King David um, was this great king in the nation of, of Israel, David and Goliath. But notice what the scriptures say. I want you to see the impact of the other side of the spiritual kingdom. Satan rose up against Israel, and I want you to look at this word and incited David to take a census of Israel. Now, I want you to think about this. See, God had commanded the kings of Israel not to amass big armies because he understood the nature of mankind is, is that when you have great success and power and wealth, it is easy to forget that God was the source of all of it and that pride steps in and pride destroys many a man and as pride comes with a fall and costs many people their kingdoms. And so God said, hey guys, I want you to trust me and I want you not to amass all of these armies so that you live in a dependence towards me and that a dependence will keep you obedient. Well, well, notice what the scripture says. So one day, um, Satan decided to go after, so spiritually attacked David by what? By, by putting a thought in his head. Did you get that? He decided. David's sitting in his castle one moment, all of a sudden he's like, oh, I, I wonder. Man, I wonder if God's gonna come through. Am I strong enough against that army? Like, I know what God said, don't do it, but maybe I just, just want this little compromise. But here's what's so amazing, look at this. This thought this emotion, this conflict it created, what was the root cause of it? It was spiritual. Like, 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 like what I want you to see, this is so important, because what God is doing, he's peeling back the window, and he goes like, all these people are running around going, look at the company I built, look at the life I built, look at the education, look at the hard work that I've got, look at all the blessings for my labor. And there's, we forget how much that the spiritual world played, both in the success of your life, also, listen to this, and the enemy trying to battle us. That for too often, we are living this world and living this life, and we're living in a way where we kind of, because we can't see it, we just assume, we just assume that, that well, my choices, that the physical realm is where I put my priorities, and the spiritual, well, when I die, I mean, that's not that, once a, once a week, I'll spend an hour, and it becomes the secondary thing. But when you actually peel back the layers and see how life and the world works, what you realize is the root cause of success, 
the root cause of some of the struggles, the root cause of the battles you face in your life are actually spiritual in nature. They are not actually physical. Now, here's why I say this. Listen to this. I want, I want you to understand the world we live in. And now I'm gonna read you this verse. And I hope that this verse begins to take on an urgency with you a little bit. Because when, when you begin to see the way the world really is, all of a sudden, when you, when you read this to you, I want you to go like, oh, I, I, gotta, like, I gotta really get this. And look at, look at what the scripture says. Okay, look at this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. How cool is that? Like, yeah, you're in a spiritual battle, but here's what's so great. God, who is greater than the enemy, right, is giving you the power you need to defeat the spiritual battles you're facing in your life. But here's, the, here's our responsibility. God gives you the power. He gives you the tools and the weapons, but you need to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You're in a battle and in a war. And our one responsibility, we don't need to be greater than the enemy. We don't need to understand everything, but what we need to do is put on this armor. And next week, we're gonna give you the five pieces to do this. You, your responsibility is to not go through life in a spiritual battle, but not have the spiritual armor on. So he's not just talking about making good decisions physically. He's saying there are specific things that God has given you to, to win the battle that you are facing. So here, listen, we need to get God's strength. We need God's armor because we have an enemy who's real life enemy that is actually creating schemes to take you out. Now, here's the next part. And this is the part I think I, I hope to help some of these dots connect. And here's what he says, listen to this. He says, for our struggle, by the way, that word struggle is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Our, our battles in life, the things that just, that just frustrate you, you lay awake at night, the, the things that have caused the pain in your life is not against, what's that word? Flesh and blood. I mean, you think it is, but it's not. Here, here's the root cause of it. But it's against the rulers and the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Listen, do you know why so many of us neglect the spiritual realm and don't really think about it? And Paul says, here's why. It's because you think all of your battles you face are simply flesh and blood. They're your emotions, they're your boss, they're your spouse, they're your teenagers, they're your ex, right? And, and so what happens, he says, listen to this. He goes, so what's going to happen is you're gonna face physical battles, but what you're not going to see is the root cause of those physical battles. Just like my wife, she has the back spasm, but, but the root cause of them is actually spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Like, do, do, do you realize what, what, what God is saying here is that so much of the emotions you feel, the anger, the anxiety, so much of the conflicts and, and that, that spouse that acts out emotionally and says those hurtful words or the parent that does that, that behind the curtain, some of the battles in your business and the, the, the obstacles that you face or your child that's going through this rebellion. And what God's saying, what, what the scripture is saying is, hey, it's so easy to dwell on the symptoms because those symptoms are people and circumstances happening in your life. But if you were to actually peel back what you would actually see, if you could see not a perception of reality, but reality, what you would actually see, it is actually a spiritual enemy that is using people, circumstances, mind, will, and emotions to take you out. Like, like King David, right? So Satan incited David to count an army, do what he shouldn't do. Now think about this. Do you think David was sitting in his castle and just sitting there and all of a sudden Satan walks in the room? Hey, King David, good to meet you. I'm the Prince of Darkness. It's great talk. Yeah, I, just, I got some great advice for you. I'd love for you to follow uh, what I say. What, what do you think happened? Think, just think of this. David's sitting there by himself and he has a thought in his head. He has a feeling. God, I don't know if I'm big enough. Like, listen, I, I know you're sitting out to, but this is just one time I'm gonna compromise because I don't know. Maybe it wasn't anxiety. Maybe it was pride. Look at me, how great. I don't know. We don't know, but we know that somehow there was an emotion in his head that wasn't from his head that led him to sin against the Lord and actually cause judgment in his life. And here's the thing. Do you think David knew it was the enemy? No, it felt like emotions, didn't it? See the point? He says, you think it's flesh and blood, but it's actually, but, but, the, but the being that put that thought in your head wasn't physical. Every thought in your head is not from your head. 
Same thing when, when Jesus tells Peter, hey, Peter, listen, Satan's coming after you. Oh, and by the way, you're gonna fail three times. Like he's gonna take you out three times in a matter of hours and the rooster's gonna crow and then you're gonna deny me and you're gonna do all these things. And I'm just telling you right now what he's going to do. And guess what you see? You can read the rest of that. And a few verses later, he fails three times. And guess what you don't see? Anybody with a pitchfork. You don't see horns. You don't see someone with 666 across their forehead. You know what you see? A crowd that's angry. Say something. People that are pawns of the devil, that don't even know what they're doing to take Peter out. You see a circumstance happen where people come against and, and begins to create anxiety in Peter's life. You, you, you see a servant girl begin to mock him in front of other people and fear. And, 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 yet, and then the rooster crows and he runs off and cries. And guess what Jesus said? All of those attacks, those people, those emotions, those circumstances, it wasn't the people. It was this spiritual enemy trying to take you out, which is why, by the way, when Jesus prepared him for victory, he tells Peter, listen, you need to pray. Hey, it's not you need to get a knife. It's not you need to toughen up. It's not you need to, no, you need to battle spiritual because there's a attack that's going to happen and the enemy's gonna use flesh and blood. You're gonna think it's flesh and blood, but it's actually spiritual. So the weapon you need to use is actually needs to be spiritual. So, so I want you to hear, so God's, what God's saying, Paul, who's seen this, he goes, let me tell you how the world really works, guys, is so much of the physical battles you think in your life, they're not physical. That there is an army of fallen angels, we'll look more at that next week, that are actually doing battle, and they can use your mind, your emotions, your, they can use other people and circumstances to try to take you out. And so once again, this is the, I want you to see the emphasis, I want you to see what he's trying to do. He goes, so therefore, you need to put on the full armor of God. The second time, just wanna remind you, you, this is your responsibility, so that when the day of evil comes, not if, so when that enemy comes after your child, when like they're ready and prepared so the enemy doesn't take him out or her out, that you may be able to stand your ground. Here's what I want you to see. If you're in a spiritual battle against a spiritual enemy, can I, can I tell you something? You can't use physical weapons to take out a spiritual enemy. Pull a gun on Satan. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'm serious, like... Put an alarm system on Satan. Doesn't work, does it? Right? You, you, you just, it doesn't. It's like what you, what you have to understand, this is so important, is that do you think Satan's going, oh, look, I see that kid over there. Oh, they're going to Harvard. Leave them alone. They're really smart. <laughs> Education is not a weapon against the enemy. Oh, look at that person. They got a lot of money. Let's not bother him or her. No, money is not a weapon. Education is not a weapon. Hey, that person's just, they're, they're an amazing, like, football player, so let's just not... You see what I'm saying? Like, like, I say this because what's happening is like we're in this battle and in this war and Paul's screaming out, you need to put on armor. You need to be ready because you have a spiritual enemy. He's gonna use flesh and blood, but you can't battle him with flesh and blood. Strategy and money and wisdom, none of those things defeat the enemy. In fact, I love this scripture where it says this. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. God says, I've given you power and authority and ability to defeat them. But your responsibility is to know what those weapons and those armors are and how to use them. Oh, and by the way, next week, we're actually gonna give those to you and I'm gonna give you five things that God tells you to do that because a lot of us are like getting our butts kicked spiritual and we don't even realize, but we don't even know the weapons to use. Like we don't even understand what the armor looks like. And some of us, listen to this, and some of us are actually living in this life like we're not in a battle at all. And if the enemy, listen to this, if the enemy looks at you and your child and he doesn't see spiritual armor on Do you think that's gonna be an easier attack or he's not gonna attack? In fact, let me, let me say this to you because I think this is such an important thing. If you could see the life the way it really was, if you could understand the way things really were, here's what you would see about your life and your children's lives. That you are a spiritual being living in a spiritual world, doing battle against a spiritual enemy, empowered with spiritual weapons, spiritual armies, angels, ministry experience, right? and spiritual authority. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. And, and I, I, I want us to see this because what you begin to understand when you look at your eternity, your soul, your life, everything, is when you see life, not the perception of reality, but what it is, you live life differently when you understand this. 
Your priorities are different when you look like at this. Sin isn't as enticing when you look like this. And the reality is this is how life is. And yet so many of us are living like we're physical beings in a physical world doing battle against physical enemies with physical weapons and we miss the entirety of it. And we sit there in this life, listen to this, and God gave us all this armor to protect us, but we don't put it on. And we're taken out by the enemy left and right. Not because God isn't able, not because we don't have the tools for victory. It's because we don't see the world the way it really is. So we don't put them on. So I, I, I share all this because this is kind of the lesson that God, one of the lessons that God needed to share with me. And so uh, many of you know, I shared in the beginning that about two years ago, my wife and I had that plan that, hey, let's take this season and let's just, we've been doing this 20 years and I don't want to wait till I'm 70, you know, and older to not be able to, you know, travel around the world. And there's a lot of things we ought to, let's take this season over the summer and we're going to go on this much needed sabbatical rest and enjoy. And we're going to be with family. It's going to be, it's going to be really, really um, special. But I got to be honest during the sabbatical, my goal, was like just to have fun. <laughs> like I spent my life in God's word, 20 hours a week studying. Like, like I spent my life. And so I'm like, God, for 60 days, I'm taking a break. I'm waking up, I'm gonna play pickleball, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna watch television, I'm gonna travel, I'm gonna swim. Like I'm just gonna have fun and just disconnect for a season of 60 days. Now, in that trip, there was this one two week period that I was looking forward to more than anything else. Like I want us to understand something. So like, this is huge because we were gonna go to my mom and dad's house and dad's right over here. And it's an, I think I have a picture of it. This is their house in Highlands, North Carolina. And this is me beating my father in croquet, by the way, just wanted to show that thing. He's trying to stare me down, but he lost. I made that shot just for the record. Um, and it's just my son's here on the boat and it's just just beautiful place in the mountains of North Carolina. And um, we've been going there for 45 years when they built this. And so um, recently my mom's not been able to attend because of her health. My nephew's not been able to come. And so I was like, during my spatula, I would love to have my whole family together. Like the final time to have all of us together for two weeks of just fun and relaxation up in North Carolina. And so I was super, super excited about it. And all I, once again, but, but part of me was like, I'm just having fun. Like I, I'm not in a battle, I'm not in a war, I'm on break, God's got me. Like I've been serving him for a long time. I just get a little bit of break. And so we go to have this trip and I'm so excited about it. And then day one happens. And we get the call, I took the boys up early, stopped by with some friends and I was driving the boys up, my wife and my mom, my dad and my sister uh, and another friend were all flying up and they were flying up. So we got in and then we get the call. Um, my 83 year old mom who I begged to come and put a dehumidifier in the house. We brought her chair up because she can't sleep well in a bed and her health, you know, we did all these things to make this happen. And so everything's there at the house waiting and we get the call, hey, we're at Atlanta airport and there's no rental cars. They took the reservation. They can't fulfill the reservation. And it's not just them. There's no rental calls July 4th weekend. There's no rental calls in all of Atlanta, Georgia. And there's nothing that they could do. All, they're calling everyone. Everyone is out of cars. Well, I actually am three hours away in the mountains and I have a Tesla. The battery's dead. I just arrived. I can't pick them up. Like I'm stuck and they're stuck there in this airport. So they're starting to panic and they're starting to get like my 83 year old mom, dad, they're stuck in this airport, no way to get there, no way to get them, no rental cars, no idea what to do. So about an hour or so go by and they, they've been calling and they found something called Toro and they, they got this other rental car and they go, we're, we're saved, we got this car, it's great. They're coming to pick us up and they get in the Suburban and they drive for about an hour until they're in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, middle of the night and all of a sudden, guess what happens? Car breaks down. And they are literally in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's so much in the middle of nowhere, the only thing around was a Waffle House. <laughs> it's not bad, their, their waffle's really good. But like, you know, so they're calling me from the side of the road going, my aide, she can't really walk real well. She's stuck on the side of the road in the middle of the mountains in the middle of the night with nowhere to go, nowhere to help, no hotels and no way for us to do anything. And as you can imagine, the tension began to rise a little bit, the stress began to happen. And so they're walking through this and finally they found someone else and the guy that rented the car from brought another car and eventually sometime middle of the night, they come, they come in and when they come in, there was some tension going on and there was some frustration happening and all these things began to happen. And, and it started two weeks of instead of having this fun, relaxing thing, there was just, we fought more in those two weeks than we had in 45 years. <laughs> day number two, day number two gets better. My mom gets an eye infection. We gotta take her to the hospital because it gets really bad. That's day number two. 
And then we're walking through. Day, num day number three, I'm playing pickleball, which is what I love to do. And I reach out for a swing and I tear my shoulder rotator cuff and I can't lose my arm. And for the rest of the trip, I'm like casting fishing with my left hand because I can't even my arm. Number three. Then we have some people call up who were not invited and said, hey, we heard you guys are vacation. We're coming. <laughs> and this family invited themselves to our vacation of which none of us except for mom and dad really even get along or know them really well. And then they have kids that are kind of unique that are really challenging that my kids want to be with their cousins, not these kids. And so we go on hikes and these kids are climbing rocks, getting stuck. And I'm there getting injured, helping these kids that I don't even want there. I'm like, God, I don't want to serve people. This is my vacation, you know? And so I'm kind of frustrated that these people came and that no one stopped them. And they're there every day and every moment all around. And so we can't really connect as a family. So then it gets worse. So this is all in three days, right? Remember, not everything physical has the root cause of physical. I'm trying to get this rest and I've been looking forward to this moment. And then I get a call, someone comes to our house or doing some work and he goes, I hate to break this to you, but looks like a water line broke underneath your house and your wood floor just all came up and we can't stop it. And the wood floor, which is solid wood floor, we cannot replace it, which means all that wood floor has to come up is being destroyed and we don't know what to do. And I'm just sitting there going, wow. <laughs> then it gets worse. <laughs> because the people that were there, the why they found the floor was, is that because we planned this for almost two years, this trip, we had planned to put this fireplace in a year and a half ago. We had all the plans drawn, everything designed, everything to go, because I love fireplaces. And we're going to put this in during the 60 days we're gone, so we don't have to live through the mess. And so we had it engineered. We had an architectural. It passed the city inspection, and they go to tear the wall out for the fireplace that I already bought. It's in the living room. All the stuff, all the floors torn up. Everything is ready. And they go, hey, hate to break this to you, but somehow everyone missed this. And that wall is solid structural concrete. You can't put a fireplace there. <laughs> and I can't take it back. And I'm like, great, welcome. To right on the first few days of our vacation. A few days later, I got what's called um, uh, exertion migraines. Never had them before. I had to look them up. But basically, anytime I'd work out, do anything, uh, it felt like there was a knife in my head. My wife would tell you, I fell down. I couldn't walk. And for seven days, I lived with consistent and constant migraines. That was just the four, first 14 days of my time to rest that I waited 20 years to do. And then our final trip was to Colorado. It was my wife's dream. She loves it. And on the morning, because they canceled our flights, another story. So late at night, middle of the night, we finally get to Colorado. We have to go to a hotel. We can't go where we're actually going just to wait. I, you know, being the great husband I am, got up early, got the rental car for my family so they could sleep in. And I go back and on the way back from the rental car, I get a text of what was going on in our house. And here's what was going on in our house. A water line, they said, underneath the pool deck, the earth shifted and cracked and the whole pool deck of our house is coming up and no one is there to stop it and no one knows where to shut the water off. And I'm driving going, okay, Lord. <laughs> and here, here's why I say all this, right? Here's why I say this, right? Because I got pretty frustrated and pretty upset and pretty angry. God, where are you? That whole, like, you know, whole thing. And in the middle of all this, after all this happened, you know what the Lord showed me? See, this is what happened when you take your armor off. See, I, I, see, my idea was, well, God, I'm not sinning. Like everything's good. Like I served you for 20 years. Things are really, really good. Like life has never been better. I just want to take like four weeks. Like that's it. I just want to take four weeks and just rest and just have fun and live life as if there isn't an enemy trying to attack. And so for those four weeks, I wasn't really ready. I wasn't really praying. I wasn't doing a lot of the things that I normally do in my routine. And God was like, yeah, but just because you took a break didn't mean the enemy's going to. See, you, you either choose to understand that you live and are living in a spiritual battle. And, and, and just because you close your eyes for a season doesn't mean the enemy stops coming. And, and it's okay to rest but it's never okay to be complacent. And it was this convicting moment in my life where God was like, like, okay, I get it, Lord. Like I'm in a battle and it's good to rest, but I always have to live with the full armor of God on. I need to understand this reality. In fact, I, I love this, I love this verse. It says, be, be, be alert and of sober mind. What does that mean? When you're intoxicated, your mind doesn't see things as they are. 
So, so he goes, what you need to be is you need to live your life. You need to parent. You need to do your marriage, your relationships. Your, you need to live your life with the understanding of a spiritual world and a spiritual enemy and the power and the influence because your enemy roams around like a, uh, uh, like a lion looking for someone to devour. And I'm telling you something, the easiest person to devour is one that's not wearing their armor. So resist him and stand firm in the faith. And here's my challenge to you. And the next week we're gonna get into the practical side of this. Is that what I think God put in my heart was this, is that many of you are living your life like I did those four weeks. You're not doing anything really wrong. I'm not saying that. I, got doing it. I, get, I can't look at anything. Oh, I messed up. Or I should, you know. No, it was just this idea of living life where we're not really understanding the battle that we are in. We're not really being proactive going, how do I make sure my children, it's great they have good education. It's good they're good at sports. I get, it. it's nice they can dress nice. All those things are fine. But how am I making sure that they are prepared against an enemy that's coming after them so that they don't lose the battle? See, if you could actually see the way things were, I'm telling you, you would live your life differently. I would have been, I would have known right away, oh, all these things happening, that's the spiritual world. Well, I'm not gonna get mad at them for what, the, the root cause of that is the enemy. So if I get mad at them and get angry towards them, instead of forgive them, all I'm doing is giving the enemy more power. Like if I understood the root cause, all of a sudden I start battling spiritual beings instead of other people. And so, so my heart for you this week is simply this. And you've heard me say this before, but I wanna repeat it. Expect a battle and expect a victory, right? God's given you armor and power, but don't expect a victory without a battle. And I wish I could tell you differently. I wish I could encourage you my first week back, every, you know, give you all this raw raw, but here's what I wanna encourage you. I think some of you, if you were to start living life and seeing the way things really were, understanding the spiritual world, has authority over, is influencing everything, is behind the flesh and blood battles. I'm telling you something, you would make different decisions, you'd have different values, you'd make different choices and you'd live in greater victory. You'd be far more concerned about your child's knowledge of the word of God than math. You'd be so much more focused of their engagement in the kingdom of God than in sports. You'd be so much more concerned about their spiritual being than the college they go to. If you could see things in your business, you, you would actually start bringing in the spiritual side, not just the strategic side. In your marriage, you would start realizing some of that conflict is not just about their issues or your issues. It's you'd be praying more. In other words, if you could see life the way it really was, you would win so many more battles. You would walk in so much greater victory. He, enemy would flee from you because he's going to run after people that aren't, don't have the armor that is on in their lives. And so my heart for you, it's not about being afraid. It's not walking about in this constant state. It's just being sober-minded and alert that the reality is you're a spiritual being in a spiritual war world doing battle against a spiritual enemy with spiritual weapons and spiritual armies and spiritual authority. And the moment you get that is when you begin to start walking in greater victory. And when you win those victories in the spiritual realm, listen to this, you will start to notice the physical realm will start to change. Your circumstances, your emotions, your relationships, the outcomes of your life, how God blesses you in all of these things. So this week, here's my heart. As a family's come back to school, all that's great. How are you putting on the full armor of God? And next week, we're gonna give you five things to do that. Let me pray. Dearly Father, thank you so much for all that you're doing and all that you've done. God, you are so good. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your authority. And God, I pray that you would just open our eyes more to the way things really are so that your children can walk in the victory and the authority that you gave your life so that we could live. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if we could, if we could just stay in this moment just for a second, if you just bow your heads, close your eyes. I just want to speak to you in the quietness of this moment. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. Uh, and I'd consider and, and ask you to consider what, what God might be calling you personally or as a family too. And if you're needing prayer today, our prayer teams are up here. And even as you're in this moment, you're like, man, I... I need someone to do some battle with me and for me as well. I need someone to come alongside me and believe in faith that I can begin to win these battles and I can put on that armor and see God move and work in my life in amazing ways. We're gonna have a prayer team up here at the end of service. I wanna challenge you, if you've never been prayed for before, 
after one of our services. Come up. These people love to do what they do, and that's why they're here. I love our prayer team so much. Let me just pray for us, and we'll, uh, we'll dismiss. I just got a couple of things for you, so just sit tight as I pray. But let me pray for you. I just felt led to do this. Jesus, we, we love you. We're just so thankful for our church, Lord. And I do pray for the people that are struggling through, through the battles, Lord. I pray that they would put on that armor, Lord. They would fight spiritual things with spiritual weapons, Lord. And I pray that we would just learn continually what those are, how to apply those. God, thank you for a church that, and a pastor that wants to call those things out. Father, to allow us to walk in victory, Lord. You've made us more than conquerors, Lord. Teach us what that looks like in our day-to-day -day life. We pray that in Jesus' name and all the journey said, amen. Hey, I wanna speak to you really quickly too. If you're like, man, how do I, how do I know what my next step is here? Like if you've never been part of what we're doing here at Journey, you want to jump in, get connected. Uh, Discover is going to be your first and your next step. That's an incredible experience. Out these doors to the right in that glass room. They're ready to receive you. They'll keep your kids a little bit longer and Journey Kids for you. They would love for you to get connected. You'll discover uh, how God has wired you to serve, how he's connected you to the church. And uh, just you'll get more of the heart and the vision of that. We would love for you to take advantage. And where are all my fellas at? Guys, where are you at? Wave, wave your hand at. Give me a, yeah, all right, fellas. Well, this one is not necessarily for you, but it is for you. Ladies, where are you at in the room? Thrive Conference is on its way. Thrive Conference at the end of September. Some of you ladies have already heard about like VIP information. Uh, Lisa Turkers is going to be with us. National speaker, author, renowned speaker. She's incredible. We're excited to host her. Fellas, I was speaking to you though first because we have an incredible opportunity for you to come serve your ladies. We're going to do that as, as our male staff. We're going to be at the event serving and loving our ladies, creating a great environment for them. If you would like to serve, that QR code behind me on the screen, grab your phone out, scan that QR code, and you'll actually be able to, to sign up to serve at that event because uh, we want to host our ladies so well, make sure they have an incredible time. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm serving by watching all our kids at home. Great. That's amazing. But if you're free, uh, September, it's going to be the 29th and 30th. If you're free those evenings throughout that day, we would love to have you serve alongside of our staff here as well at Journey. So scan that QR code. and We'd love to give you that opportunity. Would you stand to your feet? Are you glad that your pastor is back from sabbatical preaching? What a word, what a word. You do not want to miss next week. Get, get the practical tools uh, in order to continue to overcome in your life these battles and this series colliding worlds. It's going to be so good. We'll leave as we always do. Do not conform, but be transformed. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.